Tendon injuries are one of the biggest obstacles for athletes and coaches, especially if you work in basketball or volleyball or other jumping sports. But what if I told you the key to preventing them isn't just about how strong the tendons are, but also how we load them. And today we're breaking down how tendons adapt to stress, why stress shielding could be hurting your athletes, and the best strategies for tendon health and performance. Let's dive in. Tendons are not just passive structures. They're living tissues that adapt to mechanical stress. When you get the loading right and you build strong, resilient tendons, they can handle high forces. But if you get it wrong, you could be setting up your athletes for chronic tendinopathy. So two key concepts that we need to understand that we will unpack today. The first is mechanotransduction. This is how tendons sense and respond to mechanical stress. And then the second, stress shielding why certain loading patterns may actually prevent tendons from adapting properly. So today what we're going to do, we're going to break these down with a couple simple visuals. So if you're on YouTube with us, great, because you'll be able to see these. And if you're just listening to the pod, I'll do my best to explain it. But I want to give you practical takeaways that you can apply immediately with your athletes in their training to build stronger and happier tendons that perform at a high level and can handle the stresses of sport. So let's start with mechanotransduction or how tendons respond to load. And in a moment, I'm going to show you guys a figure that I have here on my computer and we'll walk through what this actually looks like. But allow me to set the stage so we're all on the same page before we get caught up in the visual. So mechanotransduction is how our tendons are going to turn load into ultimately a stronger tendon. And so visualize this. Imagine that your tendon is a highway of force transmission. And when we apply load, like in running or strength training, it's going to send signals down this highway to activate what are known as tenocytes, or these are tendon cells. This process, again, is mechanical transduction, and it's going to involve a few kind of key aspects. And on the figure, you'll see six different kind of spaces. And so mechanical loading is going to be first. This is where the tendons are going to experience this ground reaction force from activities like jumping, sprinting, lifting weights, then followed by what's known as stress propagation. And this is where the tr those forces are going to travel through the extracellular matrix, and that's going to trigger the cell response. Okay, and then that signal is going to have to be converted, and that's the mechanical force being converted into a signal that ultimately creates a biochemical response, and that's going to activate this new tissue remodeling. Okay, so there's ground reaction forces going through cellular matrix or extracellular matrix, and then a signaling happens. Okay, and that creates the matrix remodeling. Now, the tendon responds by synthesizing more collagen and proteoglycans. This is the tendon tissue that's going to ultimately be incorporated into new material okay and then there's the functional adaptation now over time the tendon is going to become stiffer and more resilient which is going to reduce injury risk and improve performance right so the takeaway is without the proper loading the tendons will lose strength and become prone to injury but with the right loading this mechanical signal is going to drive a positive adaptation so that sets the stage but let me just walk you through the figure because i think that this will make it very simple to make sense with it. So I hit the button. There we go. We should be good. And so we'll just, again, walk through these kind of key aspects of mechanotransduction. I love this figure, which is why I wanted to share it. Let's say your athlete is out running. There's a ground reaction force. That's the loading signal that's going to initiate this kind of cascade of events that ultimately will end up in positive adaptations for that tendon. So as that ground reaction forces drives through that tendon, what's going to happen? We talked about that mechanical loading stress propagation through that extracellular matrix and then mechanical transduction is turning that mechanical loading into signaling right that signaling is going to create that biochemical response for new matrix synthesis it's signaling to degrade damage uh matrix excuse me i need to hit this button so you guys can see that there you go hopefully that works yep it's working all right back through the extracellular matrix and then incorporation and remodeling of the new composition and structure and this is going to be that stiffer, stronger, more resilient tendon, right? So this is how we're going to turn ground reaction forces or tendon loading into a stronger, stiffer tendon, right? This entire mechanical transduction. Now, in a moment, I'll show you another figure for stress shielding. But again, let's set the stage. The problem of stress shielding is that not all tendon load is created equal. 
Stress shielding happens when some parts of a tendon take more load than other areas, leaving weak areas unloaded and vulnerable. And this is kind of how it works. Now, debated in the literature, but this is generally speaking what happens with stress shielding. When tendons absorb force, the healthier regions take most of the stress, whereas the weaker areas or injured areas are going to be shielded from load and then therefore remain disorganized and weak, right? And that would have a cascading effect. Over time, the unloaded areas don't remodel properly. This would lead to continued deterioration, higher injury risk, and hopefully not, but at worst, failure, right? And so two key problems. The first, tendon stress relaxation. If part of the tendon isn't loaded properly, then surrounding collagen weakens, allowing for more force to pass through the injured area, and again, ultimately could lead to failure, or maybe pain and fun- pain doesn't go away and function doesn't return, right? So failure is kind of the worst of the cases. And then dynamic loading, right? And this is one of the issues with most sporting tasks, is that their rapid movement, sprinting, jumping, cutting, these are going to bypass the injured areas preventing the necessary adaptation. And so we have to really appreciate stress shielding and therefore stress relaxation. And we'll talk about how we can do that in a moment. And I'm going to show you a figure that hopefully brings this home. Now, the takeaway is if we don't load the tendons correctly, then we may risk making certain areas stronger and then other areas weaker. And this would increase injury risk. And so this is why it's important to think through proper training. And we're going to end again in just a moment with some training stuff. So you'll walk away knowing how to do this. But let's switch over just so you can see, click my button here, just so you can see stress shielding, kind of what we're talking about here. And off to the left side here, uh, indicated by the green bar, is what we would hope to happen, right? Is proper tension going through. And if I highlight this, uh, proper ten, proper tension, excuse me, going through the tendon, evenly being distributed, and then that injured part being indicated by the black circle there. And off to the right side is we have stress shielding. And so what we see here is that stress is actually just going to go around that injured area, right? And now what we're going to do is we're going to effectively make the healthy parts healthier or stronger, and then that injured part is just going to continue to get weak over time, right? And so up top, we have this kind of time versus deformation um, graph. And this is what that stress relaxation talks about is we really want to spend a little bit more time with tendons, allowing load to get into these injured areas. And so if you spend a little bit more time, then eventually you'll get some tension into that area. And that's stress relaxation, relaxation, excuse me. And so we'll bring you guys back. We'll talk about how we can actually bring all of this together for training. So let's do that now. So you can walk away understanding what does mechanical transduction mean? What does stress shielding mean? But more importantly, how do we actually use that in our training? So let's talk practical takeaways for coaches and athletes. Now, the first one, slow progressive loading matters. Tendons are going to take three to six months to adapt to new loads and for us to see changes in that tendon. Now, obviously, pain can go away much faster than that. But generally speaking, tendons are going to take longer to adapt than muscles. Now, you're, because of that, you're going to want to avoid rapid progressions in your training, and you're going to want to build tolerance gradually. Eccentric and isometric loading is next, and this is essential. And this would go back to the figure we just saw, stress relaxation. When a tendon is loaded and held under tension, it's going to initially resist deformation and probably feed those healthy fibers quicker. But over time, the force required to maintain that deformation decreases. And this is going to happen because of collagen reorganization and water movement and all this other stuff that we don't really need to understand, but we need to appreciate in our training. So we want to spend a little bit more time to bypass that initial resistance to deformation and then allow some tension to get into those injured areas, right? And so the way that we're going to do that is eccentric loading, and isometrics. Eccentric training is that slow lengthening contraction, or at least a focus on that. And this is going to stimulate that collagen remodeling. Okay. Then you have the isometrics, which are generally speaking holds. Now you could push up against something, but for today, we're going to talk about yielding isometrics or holds, and this will improve tendon stiffness without the excessive strain on those weaker areas. So some examples, you can do some heavy, slow resistance training for the patellar or Achilles tendons. You can spend a good amount of time with some tempo work, maybe three to five second eccentrics and do multiple sets of that. That's going to be a nice way to drive some of that tension into those healthy areas. Train tendons in multiple planes and speeds. This is next, kind of as we go through our progression. Tendons respond best when exposed to various stress patterns. So you're going to want to use a mix of slow and controlled movements, as we just talked about, as well as explosive exercise, right? That would go back to the said principle. 
you're going to want to combine some slow squats, some eccentric focus stuff, some eccentric legs, leg extensions, excuse me, some isometrics on that with things like pogos, reactive jumps, stuff like that, right? And generally speaking, as we keep going, you're going to want to avoid complete rest because again, tenants don't like drastic changes in loading. So when you have complete rest, you're going to also obviously come back to loading and that would be a spike. And so they need some level of mechanical stress to maintain their structure. Structure, excuse me. All right, pain-free isometrics can be used early in rehab. This is a nice one. And then gradual reloading is going to prevent some of that stress shielding and ensure proper remodeling. So those are some takeaways. Let's just get into the nitty gritty training recommendations for stronger tendons. Okay. So early phase stuff, preventative and rehab stuff. Ebony Rio Research, we've we haven't talked about this on the pod, but I've wrote about it. The five by 45 second protocol, those have become super popular. Isometrics generally are analgesic. They can help some people get out of pain. Not everyone, but try them. Okay. Slow eccentrics, three to four sets of six to eight reps with a four to five second lowering phase. And then we get into our kind of mid-phase stuff, right? Building stiffness and strength. Obviously, the heavy, slow resistance is going to build some strength, some slower tempos. Do that with the squats. Do that with the calf raises. That's going to be for the knees, for the Achilles, all of that. And then finally, you get into plyometrics. And this is kind of that integration of it all. We've done our heavy and slow. We got to do some fast and explosive. Low impact hops, extensive hops, bounding, rebounding. And then finally, like whatever level we're on next, right? The advance would be kind of fast stretch shortening cycle stuff. This is your sprints, your depth jumps, your multi-directional stuff. This is stuff that looks like sport. You're going to get a ton of it in sport. So we're going to want to prepare our athletes for sport, right? Set principle. All right. So I know I threw a lot out of at you today. Tendons are certainly much more deeper than that. But today, I think we did a good job of talking about stress shielding. We talked about mechanical transduction. We've talked about some takeaways. And hopefully, you walked away with things to think about in your programming. Remember, me mechanical transduction is going to help tendons adapt. But stress shielding can prevent them from properly remodeling. So you want to be conscious of both and apply them in your training. Smart progressive loading, eccentrics, isometrics, and plyometrics. And I would almost do them in that order, or isometrics, eccentrics, plyometrics. Do them in that order as you progress through your different phases. Hopefully that was helpful. If it was, do me a solid, hit the subscribe button, share this with someone else, and I'll drop a link below so you can subscribe to our newsletter where I share stuff like this multiple times per week directly to your inbox. See you next time.